Well, morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. We'll do one. We'll do one more. Good, no reverb. No, re no reverb, good. <laughs> nice and dry. All right, there we go. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. So tonight we're going to have a healing service. So we'll just teach on healing. We'll pray for some folks, not just for body, but for soul. <laughs> Sometimes people just have depression and we just need to pray that God will bless them and move that extra weight off them. Because how many of us know that even just stress is not good for the body? <laughs> That's why Jesus says, cast our burdens on him, right? Take his, our yoke, uh, his, his yoke on us. Because uh, it's easy, it's light. It's, we're not supposed to be... Uh, trudging through Christianity. Uh, that's for sure. Not when we have the Jesus we've got. Um, so I'm just going to jump into it this morning because it's a bit of a, it's not really a preach this morning. Normally I like to just keep Sundays a little lighter, but it's going to be more of a teach. <laughs> I hope you brought your Bibles. Because <laughs> um, here we are at the, uh, you know, as uh, Sam and Frodo discuss at the end of all things. <laughs> As Paul told Timothy, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves, that's a remarkable statement, right? That's in 2 Timothy 4 there, uh, where Paul's warning to Timothy, his son in the faith, is the, you know, the number one peril. Number one is that people are just going to put themselves first. Right? They gotta love themselves. It's amazing, but that's what we see. And uh, as the, as far as the church and what we are, that can't be us. <laughs> Yet, sadly, that's how you know some people are gonna put themselves first. But uh, and that people aren't gonna know then that we're his disciples. Like Jesus said, right? How how will they know your disciples? But by that love, right? By that love, that the same love Jesus said that the Father has loved me would be in them. That's one of Jesus' prayers in uh, John. That's amazing. The same love God loved Jesus should be in us. That's amazing. <laughs> That's huge love. That's huge love. Imagine that. The same level of love that the Father has for Jesus should be in us. But I want to start by looking at uh, an interesting an interesting verse. And I think, to be honest, one of the things that will, that keeps us in love is actually walking in truth. You know, because when you get into error and get into deception, it's very hard for that channel of living, you know, the living word to flow into our life for the love of God that we do get from the word, right? When we, when we read the word, when we obey the word, when we do things the way God says, uh, the love of God is just in our midst because you're being obedient children. And God just pours out his love on those that walk with him. But I want to look at something interesting here. We're going to talk a little bit about the New Testament church this morning. I know, super exciting. <laughs> Hallelujah! But uh, we're going to start by going to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles, and I'm going to intentionally read it out of my new Bible. I ordered a, a new Bible. I wanted to have one that's not my big study Bible. So I got one. came this week. I love it. All right, so we're going to go to 1 Chronicles 13. Now, this is, uh, you know, it's an exciting time. We've got David as king. The ark uh, is, you know, the plan for the ark is to bring it back to Jerusalem, to bring it back to, a, to uh, the center of the reality of Israel. 
And we know the ark is obviously a picture of God's glory. And that's what everyone wants today. Everyone wants God's glory and the power and miracles of God going on. And we want God's presence with us. Um, and so we, we pick up the story here. David, uh, verse 1, chapter 13 says, David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us. Because at this time, right, it had not been among them. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shehor of Egypt unto the entering of Hamath to bring the ark of God from kirjath Jerim. And David went up, and all Israel, to Bala, that is, to kirjath Jerim, which belongeth to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on. Now, obviously, you're an Israelite. You want this thing in your camp. <laughs> Right? You want the ark of God. Here it is. God dwells between the cherubim. Right? We want God's presence with us. This is the, the thing that dwelt in the tabernacle with Moses in the Holy of Holies. Where God's visible, tangible presence dwelt above this ark. And of course there's the mercy seat. And that's what we want with us. Absolutely. Should we have it with us? You better believe it, baby. But let's see what happens. And so David goes up and everyone uh, and all Israel... Right, to bring up the ark of the Lord in verse 7. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart. So here we are, they've got the ark, hallelujah, they're bringing it back to Jerusalem. They called all Israel together. They even got some priests and Levites together. We like those guys, they're important. <laughs> right? It's good to have those guys around, right? Verse 8, and David and all Israel, look at this, we have a, we're having a revival, hallelujah, a revival. And David, I don't know why I'm singing, and David and all Israel played before God with all their might. And it looks good, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalteries, and timbrels, and cymbals, and with trumpets. It is going good. It's going really good. There's David, the anointed one of God. Using his gift and talent, all Israel with him, dancing and singing and shouting unto God. Verse 9, And when they came unto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, wherefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obadidim the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obadidim in his house three months. We can just stop there. So here we have Israel and David, right? The anointed one, definitely anointed. Wait, we all agree David's anointed, <laughs> right? Samuel was there. The horn of oil came out, 100% anointed, right? We have written evidence, proof he's anointed. We know he's called of God. There's no doubt. We know Israel's, these are God's people. We know the Levites and the priests are there. And they're just dancing and they're praising God. And wait, look at that. Play before God with all their might. I don't think I've ever done that. Like with all my might, played guitar. You know, I've gotten close maybe, but I don't know if I can say, Aaron, that was you played with all your, everything you had, you played with all your might. So they are just giving God every drop they have here. And it looks so good till they get to that threshing floor. It's always good till the threshing floor. Right, till there needs to be a separation of the chaff from the wheat, from doing something in our strength and doing something God's way. And isn't this always the difference? 
right? In life, we're going along, we're loving God, and we know God's called us, hallelujah, God, and we're going, but then all of a sudden, something negative happens. And David's like, this is what I like about David, this is what so many people do. Okay, gosh, look what God did. That's not good, right? David was afraid, just in verse 8, he's playing and dancing before God. Verse 12, it says David's afraid of God. That's funny, eh? How a revival meeting could just change, changes when someone dies. But let's see here, let's see here, let's continue on. David realized something, right? David realized something. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 15. See, David, thankfully, understood that God's plan for the ark was to bring it to Jerusalem. But there's, there's a way with God, right? We don't just get to do things our way. And this is the big distinction. We, we look at so many churches, and, they, and we go, okay, they all want the glory of God, and everyone wants the glory of God, hallelujah, and we all have our, our wonderful worship times. And yet we go, well, what's going on here? And we have to, if we're sincere and honest, we have to go, are we actually seeking God according to His pattern, His plan? Right? Because He has a way. <laughs> he has a way. Like the church is not supposed to be a, a government organization that's religious, which sadly most churches are, right? They live off their charity status. Uh, and that's how people kind of relate to the church, as a charity, a place where they give out food and clothes and they're nice, like any other charity. But that's not what defines us. What defines us is that we follow God's plan and His instructions. That's what makes us different. So 1 Chronicles 15, I'm going to read from verse 1 here. We'll just read a couple verses. So, and David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Look at this, verse 2. It says, And then uh, David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. Now, when we were back in 1 Corinthians 13, the Levites weren't carrying the ark. <laughs> it was coming up on a new cart. They put the ark on a cart. Right? It was being pulled by oxen. And that's not how God said that you're supposed to carry it. Go to verse 12. First Chronicles 15, 12. So this is uh, David here. It says, and, and said unto them, and it was, David calls these sons and says unto them, right? He called for the Levites. We saw before Levites and priests were there. They were around, but an ark was carrying the cart. Right? Where did David pick that up? We saw when he spent some time with the Philistines, the, the Philistines sent the ark originally back to Israel on a cart. Right? They put it on a cart, put a few little offerings back, said, get this thing out of here. Because remember, God kept destroying their God. <laughs> Dagon kept getting his head and hands cut off. And they said they put their the ark on a cart and sent it back. So David did the same thing. David put the ark on a cart. To bring it into Israel. But then David read the word of God and said, Ah, the only people who are supposed to carry this thing are the Levites. Now the Levites were there at the first party. But they weren't doing their job. So verse uh, verse 12 here. And he says, so David talked. He says unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. And here it is, he gets the revelation, verse 13. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. Right? God has an order, he has a way to bring his glory, to usher his glory into his people. But when we just want to do it our way, <laughs> And it doesn't work. Why isn't this working? Well, are we consulting the manual? <laughs> right? Are we consulting the manual for God's way? 
That's what David needed to do. Here we have, like, what did God mind the singing? No, he didn't mind the singing and the dancing. That there were priests and Levites there, or all Israel was there. The problem was the ark was not supposed to be carried on a cart. It's supposed to be borne, right? The weight of it is carried by God's ministers, those he sent in. And that's what we have a job to do, right? As the ministers of God, is we have to carry that. The weight of God's glory, his presence, the burden of it is actually on us to carry it. Right? Are we relying on some new method? <laughs> right? Trying to be more relevant to society, do something new, right? It was a new cart. Oh, this is a new thing, man. We all like new things. Or are we going to just trust that the Word of God, His way, is enough? <laughs> and that's a decision we have to make. David made the right decision. David sought the Lord and said, Wow, he didn't just get depressed. He did initially. He was scared and sad, like, What's going on? But it says in verse 1 of 13 or 15 there, it said, He still prepared a place for the ark. He's like, you know, I know God wants the ark here. He still prepared a place, but he didn't know how to bring it the right way. He didn't know how to do things the right way. And then he searched the word of God. He, he saw back, in, and it's in, um, well, I think I have the cross reference here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Exodus, Exodus 25, verse 14, if you want the cross reference. That's where Moses says that they are to put the staves in the ark and, and how... The, the priest is supposed to carry it. It's not supposed to be on a cart. And so David was good. He sought the Lord. He sought the word of God, found out God's way to do it. And then let's pick it up here. Let's go down to um, verse 15. Right? First uh, Chronicles 15, 15. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God on their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. Very different from just a couple chapters ago. Not a new cart. And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers with instruments of music, psalteries, harps, cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So they set up all the singers. We saw that happen before. Right? And verse, let's pick it up in verse 25. So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen and all the Levites that bear the Ark and the singers. And the Chenaitha, the, the master of the song with the singers, David also had upon him an ephod of linen, or an ephod. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting, and with the sound of the cornet, and with trumpets, and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harp. And it came to pass, uh, and then obviously he brings it, and then we know about Michael despising him because he's dancing. But the ark comes in. The dancing's going on in both chapters. The priests and the Levites are there in both chapters. All Israel is there in both chapters. The difference is the ark actually makes it to where it's supposed to go because it's being born the right way. It's being born, as David said, in the right order, right? There's an order that things are supposed to be in. Right? The body of Christ, we're, we're a military encampment for another kingdom. Right? And, uh, and we're supposed to do things in a certain order. God's way. Hallelujah. God's way. There's an order to things, because he's our captain. He's our captain. And it says, that's why I love it. Notice verse 26, though. 1526. Right, and it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. You notice that? God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Now just compare that with back in chapter 13, verse 9. Right, when they came onto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. So in one instance, we see a situation where all oh, the ark is shaking a bit, I'm just going to help out God here. <laughs> and that's what we do in our strength very often when we're not doing things the right way. When we're not doing things how God showed us. And, that, and the other thing, when you're doing things God's way, all of a sudden God helps you. Wow, that's what I want. I don't want to try and stable the glory of God by doing things my way. I'm just, it's not going to happen. 
It's not going to happen. But we see when we do it God's way, as I love the contrast there. Uzzah, right, the ark's shaking because the oxen are stumbling, so he doesn't want the ark to fall. He thinks he's doing something good by you know, touching the ark, but you don't get to touch God's glory. <laughs> he doesn't share that with anyone else. We don't get to just touch God's glory. And yet here we have God helping the Levites. That's so awesome. And that's what I want. So I want to be doing things the right way so we get God's help. God's help. God's help in the situation. Uh, that's absolutely what we need to do. So let's jump over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And really, the, the core of this whole thing, you know, we'll, we'll look at some of the elements of the New Testament church, but are we, you know, building our individual lives, firstly, on what the Word of God says. That's what David had to do, right? You, Jesus talks about those that worship the Father much worship Him in spirit, but not just in spirit, in truth, right? David initially, right, First Chronicles 13, they had the spirit part, right? Right? Absolutely. Because nothing changed, really, from 15 to, or 13 to 15, doing exactly the same thing. The problem was in 13, they didn't have the truth part right. They had the ark on a cart, not on the priests of God, not on the Levite's shoulders. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, something we're very, very familiar with. Jesus talking here. It's written in red. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, nor was, uh, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. See, when David had had the ark and had the failure with the ark. Basically, when David's house fell, <laughs> right? He was trying to bring the ark in. Uzzah gets killed because he, they disobeyed God. And all of a sudden, that little house of joy that they were building fell to pieces because they didn't build it on what God had said to do. God had said, Levites are supposed to carry this thing on their shoulders. David disregarded that, didn't bother searching the word, and someone died as a result. It's pretty serious. It's pretty serious. But Jesus says here, this is why I love what Jesus says. And I like that when you, when you do this, when you obey the words of Jesus, right? When we just read this book and say, okay, Jesus, I believe you're God. <laughs> you probably have a good idea on how I should live my life, right? Because <laughs> you designed me. Uh, so I'm going to just listen to you. But, and I like what Jesus says. He says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, right? I'll liken him unto a wise man. God himself, Jesus right now, as we say, you know what, Lord? I see what's written there. My life's going like this, a bit of a shipwreck. I'm going to bring it back to the word, to what the word says I'm supposed to do. And Jesus says, there's a wise man right there. I like that guy. He looks down and says, there's a man who's got some wisdom. Because he's obeying what I say. He's doing what, he, what I say. That's why I like how he, Jesus also adds that it's not just about hearing Jesus. Right? We're used to coming Sunday and Wednesdays and hearing about Jesus. Hallelujah. And we should. But if we don't put what we hear into our feet, <laughs> into our hands, right? it's not that good. There's something about when we apply the word of God to our life that gives strength and endurance and power to our life. Both of these men here, Jesus talks about, both of them hear the words of Jesus. They both hear his word. And that's not wrong, but one puts it into action, right? One obeys it, one follows in his path and says, I'm going to do what you told me to do. And one has no regard for it. One said, oh, that's nice, Jesus. <laughs> Very nice sermon, Jesus, hallelujah. And goes about his way and lives his life. And yet the storm comes, and we know, man, if you're in the last days, the storms of life are going to come. But our house doesn't have to fall. Jesus wants us to have victory, right? That's why we have good news for people. I have good news for you. <laughs> There's a God that's real. Jesus is real. 
Jesus wants you to have victory when the storm comes. He doesn't say the storm's not going to come. Right? Some people teach that, oh, you know, you follow Jesus, there'll be no problems. <laughs> That's not the gospel. The gospel is in the midst of the storm, there's peace. Right? In the midst of it, your house doesn't have to fall. It's going to come. It's going to beat on that house. But if you're founded on not just his words, but actions, right? Doing what he said then you can stand when the storm comes. There's this experiment uh, by these two uh, guys who were studying the brain back in 19, I think it's 62. It's called the Heinheld experiment. So what they did, they used kittens. Now, don't do this yourself. It's kind of sad. <laughs> it's a sad experiment, but fascinating about the brain and about this verse in particular. So they put two cats, like kittens, in these two baskets in a room and they would slowly just uh, spin it, but it was based on one cat had access, like its legs were coming out of the bottom of the basket, so it could walk around and explore the room. And the other kitten could just, it was still in the basket, it could see everything, but it wouldn't engage the room. It wouldn't walk around, it wouldn't do anything. It was just in the basket looking at the room. That was it. And what they had found out, and this is, again, very sad, and then they put the cats back in the room with their, their mother after, and they kept doing this, the cat that wasn't using its legs would eventually go blind. And what they discovered is, in order for the eyes to have relevance to the brain, the legs had to be engaged in that early development of kittens. Isn't that funny? And I go, wow, that's amazing, because it's like the body, the basically the mind would say, look, if you're just going to look at things, we're just going to shut down the eyes, because you don't that's not living, right? We need you to move your legs. Right? We need you to be engaged with the world. So the brain would just shut down the optic nerve if the legs weren't moving. That's amazing. It's, again, a very crazy experiment called the Heinheld experiment. But that's what we see here. Right? Jesus is saying, if you're just going to kind of observe, be an observant Christian, <laughs> you know, there, I hear Jesus talking, wonderful, look at him, there he is, isn't that good? And you don't put it into your legs and into your hands, right? You're going to lose out. There's going to be destruction in your life. That's exactly what he says here. But if you do it, and then James picks up on this, I think probably most of James's whole epistles based on this. <laughs> it seems like this one example. Faith without works is dead. <laughs> you know, this obviously was very it impacted James in a huge way. James is just probably walking around for three years thinking, man, I don't want my house to fall. <laughs> and he says, man, if we don't put what Jesus says to action, the storms are just going to take us out. You know, faith without works is dead. What are we doing, right? And that's why when we were talking about finance and all that stuff, there's, there's action that we can put to it. It's not just knowing God wants us blessed and God wants to, you know, use us. There's actions we can engage to start this Word of God working that protects us. Protects us and builds us up. Let's look at Matthew 15, verse 8 for a sec. Matthew 15, verse 8. I'm going to read from verse 3. Verse 8 is where we're going. Mm, actually, I'll read from verse 1. So then came, to Jesus, uh, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. It's funny, uh, just that alone, very often when you're in meetings, uh, and you're really listening to the Spirit and being sensitive to how the Spirit wants to do things, very often you get people who have this kind of thing rise up in their hearts, especially if we're sort of used to doing church a certain way or they're used to church a certain way. They go, why are you doing it like that, dude? You know, that's not how we do it. <laughs> you know? And then, then, then we have an instance where, yes, there's the liberty that we have in, in say, a church service, we have to... You know, the, the prescription that God says is primarily to be led by the Spirit in it. Like we know we should be sharing the Word. We, we see where they'll sing a, a psalm or a hymn. We see those things. But we have to be very, very careful that even the tradition of how we should do church 
doesn't become a tradition that's over what we actually should be involved in, and that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We want actually God to reach people's hearts. <laughs> right? We actually want a message from God to come and change people's lives, to give them perspective and direction and encouragement. We don't just want it to become a system of religion that everyone just gets comfortable in that changes no one's life. <laughs> That is awful. <laughs> That's not Jesus, right? Jesus says, when you hear my words and you do them, your life will be strengthened. The storm's going to hit your life and you're not going to fall. That's amazing. So we have to be listening to him. So they hear these Pharisees and you know, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash off their hands when they eat bread, right? They would uh, traditionally wash their hands three times. Say a prayer over their hands. You know, one of the many Barukata prayers. But it's not in the Bible. <laughs> it's not a part of Torah, right? To wash your hands before you eat bread. But they developed these elaborate traditions and they held them in high esteem over the Word of God. And so we also have to check that, right? David got to a spot with this new cart, with a new cart, and putting the ark on the cart held precedent over the word of God at that time in his life. And it brought, what? Destruction to his house. Definitely brought destruction to Uzzah. Maybe he was a dad, maybe he was a grandfather, maybe a children. In a second, they lost their relative because they disobeyed the word of God. That party could have continued, right? First Chronicles 13, they're singing, they're dancing with all their might. All they had to do was do it the right way. Put the ark on the Levite's shoulders and that party could have continued right to Jerusalem. God wants the, the joy and the blessing, but he just wants it done the right way. So verse 3 said, But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. So Jesus is quoting the Torah here. But ye say, right, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. Meaning, right, because I'm being so religious and so spiritual, mom and dad, here studying in Jerusalem, <laughs> I don't need to take care of you because I'm doing the better thing. <laughs> being spiritual. Hallelujah. And Jesus says, I know. You, you don't get to disregard honoring your parents just because you want to have a spiritual trip here in Jerusalem. Become some highfalutin Pharisee. No, you don't get away with that, right? And you honor not your father and your mother. He shall be free, that's what they said. Thus have you made the commandment of God of not effect by your tradition. That's one of the, the biggest things that quench the power of God. When we say don't quench the spirit, that's one of the biggest things. When we want to see right the glory of God in our midst, David wanted to see it. He wanted to bring the ark to Jerusalem, right? So that God's power and glory would rest on it. God said he would. And here Jesus says, you've made the commandment of God of none effect. That's fascinating. Because God's commandments are not there to burden us. They're there to bless us. Right? They're to bless us. <laughs> to bring us to a place of peace and trust and confidence so we can know, no God, we're doing things like you said. We're doing it according to your word. So we can be confident. Even when the storm comes, we can be confident going, no, we are obeying you. We're doing what you said. But here, because of traditions, because of systems of man, and again, talking about the New Testament church, you know, so many churches fall into this trap where they've developed over some over centuries, depending on the denomination, traditions that stop the power and the commandment of God from having life. Right? Jesus said the words I speak are spirit and their life. He came that we would have life and that more abundantly. We're told in the New Testament that Jesus' commands, they're not grievous, they're not hard for us. They're not hard for us. But if we have our tradition, like I think this is how it should be, and, and it's not a biblical position, we need to wonder about that. Because <laughs> what that does, that pinches off the life from that command that's coming in. God's not shutting it down. We're shutting it down. So we need to look at, maybe, you know, are we carrying things the way God wants them to carry? 
Like Pastor Randy will know this, you know, just because you say, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to be a pastor, doesn't make you a pastor. <laughs> you, can be, you can be 22, you graduated from Bible school, that doesn't make you a pastor. A pastor is an Ephesians 4.11 gift of Jesus Christ. Right? It's got to be something that Jesus moves through you himself. Right? It's, it's, it's not, you don't just get to choose it. You know, Paul didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I, I just feel like being an apostle today. <laughs> no, it's a call of God. God has to bring you in. And, and again, it's a life ministry of Jesus Christ himself. Right? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. All Jesus is... Uh, really, he's kind of divided himself up and then moves himself through men for the sake of building up his church because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we'll finish this part here. Um, so Jesus says, uh, ye hypocrites, right? You've made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying... This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's like that old expression, Christians don't tell lies, they only sing them. <laughs> oh, you are my all. <laughs> and then people leave, and he's not their all at all. <laughs> he's their, like, tenth down on the list. But we have to watch out for that. We don't want to be those hypocrites. We want, and that's just meaning, look, when our, our you know, hypocrite is the idea of like a, an actor, basically, right? An overface. An actor. You're pretending. You're honoring a lot of lip service. It's like people put on their best Christian every Sunday. You know? <laughs> oh, it's time to be, time to kind of play the Christian. It's like, no, our, our whole, the, what we are Sunday should be equal what we are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're just the same. We're just the same every day. But this people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's exactly what was going on with David. Exactly. Right? They had this uh, commandment of men that they said, this is doctrine. Right? Here's David, the anointed one of God, the prince of Israel. He summons all of Israel, if it seems good to you and to God, you know, everybody get together, we're bringing the ark up. Everyone says, yes, this is it, this is God, this is God's will, 100%. Everyone thought it was God's will, and everyone was completely wrong. <laughs> everyone saw the ark on the cart, there it is, hallelujah, dance, 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 and no one said, wait a sec, but the word says, it's amazing, right? It's amazing. That's when everyone, sometimes, and well, you have to just accept that, there's sometimes when 100% of people are wrong. <laughs> and the Bible is the only thing that's right. And we have to be willing, humble enough, right, when we recognize a situation, to be like, God, what are you really saying in that situation? What are you really saying for us to do here? And that's hard sometimes. That, you know, you've got an environment. Think of David's environment. Thousands of people around singing and dancing, and yet the core of it is being done the wrong way. That's so sad. And, the, and death is about to happen and destroy that party. You know, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty remarkable, but that's just what Jesus says. In vain they do worship me. So all that singing and dancing, you know, was a vanity. It never accomplished anything. It never ushered in God's presence to Jerusalem. It ended up, instead of being a party, it ended up being a funeral. They didn't know they were singing the funeral dirge of Uzzah. <laughs> it's, it's quite remarkable. But again, when we do things God's way, like we saw with the Levites, God help them. That's what I want. <laughs> I want to be like, God, how do you say we should do things? How do you say it in your word? I want to do that, and then I know, God, you'll help me. He doesn't leave us alone, thank God. <laughs> he doesn't just say, okay, find out what to do in my word, and good luck. <laughs> good luck. No, he helps us. I will be with you always, right? I'll be with you. The Lord is my helper. It's so good. The Lord is my helper. Hmm. A couple more verses here. Let's jump to John 16. 
John 16. And we'll look at verse 5. Yeah, this could be a three-hour teaching. I'm not going to do that to you, though. <laughs> All right, 16, verse 5. Now, Jesus says here, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. So Jesus is talking to his disciples about leaving. But because I have said this unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. That's an amazing statement again, right? It's better for you. It's, there's more purpose, right, that I go. <laughs> we would all much rather have Jesus here. But Jesus is like, look, guys, it's better for you. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That's remarkable. Because what we're seeing here, though, and what they didn't understand is that principle. If a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it divides alone. But when it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Right? So the devil, initially, when Jesus is on the earth, Jesus was enemy number one. <laughs> but when Jesus dies, is raised, and then sends the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden he's got enemy number 12, enemy number 120, enemy number 3,000, enemy number 8,000, like it just keeps expanding the church as it grows, and the Holy Spirit fills God's people in the same way he filled Jesus. It's pretty amazing. Paul says that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. What a statement. But Jesus is saying, it's better for you that the Holy Spirit comes. You need him with you. Right? For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I'll send him. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. I like that, because very often we try to take it all on ourselves. Right? We try, I'm going to help God here. I'm going to be the one that convicts people. <laughs> and we try and convict them. We use this book, and oh, we let them have it. Ah, yeah! All have sinned. <laughs> but if we don't learn to do it with the Lord, <laughs> right? With the Lord, we have, we're, we're going to be you know, whole, trying to help the ark. I'm just going to help God save this guy <laughs> by my great knowledge. <laughs> you know, like when uh, I led Damien to the Lord in jail, uh, I was not using great knowledge and great wisdom. I was so dependent on the Holy Spirit to give me the right words. I, what do you say to a guy who doesn't want to talk to you? In jail. <laughs> you know, what do you say? The Holy Spirit knew. I didn't know, like, okay, the key is going to be to tell them about purpose. That doesn't get everybody into the kingdom of God, you know? Uh, but that was the thing he was asking God for. Why am I here? Some people are just happy to not go to hell. <laughs> Hallelujah! Yeah, I believe in that, Jesus. Right? But uh, you just don't know. We have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. And when he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me. And that's what we need. We need people. They don't believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit needs to work and show them that. Because they don't see it without the work of the Holy Spirit. We can, we can give them as much scripture as we can. But if it's not by the Spirit of God, us working together... Right? We do, we're not going to see a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Right? Logically, you shouldn't want to go to hell. If hell's real, any logical person wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> we can, they can all mentally assent that that's bad. Right? But it's not about a mental assent. It's about a belief in a heart. And we need God who made the heart to go into that heart and convict it. See, of sin because they believe not in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And then I'll just read verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So here Jesus is saying, look, guys, 
I know you like having me here, but it's better for you when the Holy Spirit comes. He's essential. He's necessary for this next phase of things that God's going to do. You don't understand it now, but you will. Let's jump to Acts 1.6. Again, we're really we're looking, you know, contrasting. Are we doing things how, how God wants it done? Or are we doing things in our own strength, trying to help God out? <laughs> and because that's the thing, once we once we learn that it's not in our strength we're gonna accomplish anything, then your prayer life gets better. Your focus it is set on him, on trusting him. <clears throat> verse 6, Acts 1, verse 6. I'll read from verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 6. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? That's not a bad question. Here's the Messiah. <laughs> Here he is. And not only that, at this time, he's raised from the dead. Okay, so you're totally victorious over everything right now. Can we, is Israel going to, you know, all those prophecies about Israel, they come to pass now? And he says, and they, that's just what they didn't understand. They didn't understand this little side road of the times of the Gentiles. Where all of a sudden, the glory of God's going to be in people. They're going to become the temple of God, right? The mystery hidden from the ages, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's going to go into all the world so that everyone on the whole planet, you know, up in Siberia, over here, has an opportunity to come into God's kingdom. Israel was very much, uh, you know, a racially defined nation at the very least, right? If you ain't in Israel, you ain't part of God's covenant, right? That's it. That was where the wall was. You had to be part of that nation. You had to become a proselyte to get in on anything that God was doing. But now it's going out to the whole world. It was just something they were still, especially at the beginning of Acts, not really understanding. But he says, uh, verse 7, And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. And this is the thing. Jesus is like, look, I know you're wondering about Israel and the kingdom and all that stuff. That's not the focus right now. The focus right now, and he brings it here in verse 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and, and as you know, Pentecostals and people, we, everyone likes that and they stop there. But that's not just to have power in the Holy Ghost. The next part is why. <laughs> and ye shall be, right, witnesses unto me. We're supposed to witness of Jesus. That's what it's for. <laughs> right? Not so you can just have a Holy Ghost time, those are good times to have. Special services are always fun. But if we don't take it, you know, witness of Jesus to people, we're missing the point. And that's why Jesus is like, look, I'm, I'm the only one here when it's just me. But it's better if I go send the Holy Spirit that he can be in you all. And you can all go into all the world. Just like the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Right? You'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth over here in Wiminji on James Bay. <laughs> We're a long way from Israel. <laughs> a long way from when Jesus said this. We're definitely in these uttermost parts of the earth fulfilling this word. But we have to recognize it also. Uh, we can't, like there's many denominations that have no Holy Spirit evidence at all in any of their churches. And that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, you need him with you because it's his power in you that allows you to actually be a witness. Right? Be a witness. If we just went up to someone and they're there in trouble, it doesn't matter if it's healing, if it's financial, if it's mental or emotional, a lot of mental and emotional these days, and we go, I've got good news for you. And they say, what is it? And you say, well, you know, we just tell them some nice moral stories. And there's not a God that can actually come and help them go from a place of depression to joy. Right? How good is that news? There has to be power to witness of Jesus Christ. It's like, I think, you know, one of the ways the Lord introduced us to, you know, working with First Nations, we were up in a... Uh, in BC, so I had, we were working with Camp Living Water in Alberta, then we were in BC uh, with a guy named uh, Larry, 
and we were driving around to remote uh, First Nations communities, and we took this one bus up a logging road, and it was a place called Takla, Takla, BC. It's right on the lake, very remote, very beautiful, and there was this lady there, and I didn't know this till after. Uh, I, had, I was asked to preach that night, and so I just preached, and then I prayed for people afterwards. And then I found out after that she, what had happened with her, six years prior, she saw her husband and son drown in a canoe just in front of her, just in the lake. They ran into trouble on the lake, she was on the shore, and she watched them drown and struggle. No one could get to them in time. So she, she saw that. And then uh, 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 really a supernatural evil depression came on her and put her in a place of bondage where she was just like in a, how, a, a cloud, a haze of, of depression for six years. And then when I prayed for her that night, God supernaturally set her free. Supernaturally set her free. And, and then afterwards I found out about that. It was the first time she felt joy in six years. Because God's real. <laughs> Because <laughs> we're not just up there doing like Jesus said, lip service. Oh, I'm going to tell you about this nice God. I know you're in a place of depression. I know that's sad. However, isn't God wonderful? No. Jesus can actually come in by the Holy Spirit and take, dig out that depression and replace it with peace and joy. That's what I love. Right? That's what I love. And it doesn't matter how hard the situation, right? God can give us peace and joy in the midst of it. That's why for us, we go, oh, I want to do things the right way. If we don't allow for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, that's the whole thing with the New Testament church. If we don't allow for Him to reach people and touch people's hearts, we are missing it. We just become, uh, you know, we're preaching the letter and the letter kills. But if we're not doing it with the Spirit of God, we're missing out. We need the Holy Spirit to touch people, to change their hearts, to change their lives. We'll just look at two more verses here. Two more verses. All right, let's go to... I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Let's go to Titus, Titus 1. Verse 5. When uh, David gets his revelation of why people died, or why Uzzah died, and the party stopped, he makes a statement that says, because we didn't seek him after the due order. Right? God has a way, he has a, uh, an order that he sets things in. Right? He's not the author of confusion. Right? He's not the author of confusion. If, if we see confusion in our life or confusion in the church service, that's not God. It doesn't mean you can't have a good time in church and all that stuff. But it shouldn't be a place of confusion. Right? The Holy Spirit can bless and there can be joy and there can be might and there can be power. But there should be a measure of order there. For this cause, verse 5, for this cause left I the uh, in Crete. Right, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Like that, right? So Paul's care, and this is what we should have as we care for the church of God, right? We should say, is that you know, are people doing things their own way, or are we doing things according to the word of God? Right? And and that's the nice thing. If we love this word, our job is really not complicated. <laughs> We just read it, we, you know, we see, that's why we don't have like, you know, 30 guys up here just speaking all at one time, <laughs> standing here prophesying, because Paul tells us, don't do that. <laughs> Paul says that, right? even if you were going to have, you know, a prophet speak, no, it's going to be in order. It's not just going to be chaos, everyone stands up and says, I've got a word from God, and we all just start prophesying loudly into the air. We don't do that. There's an order because the Word of God shows us how to do it. Right? But Paul's care for the church, right? For this cause, let that be in Crete, that you should set in order the things that they're wanting. Set in order. Put things in place. And that's, again, that's our job. Because we want the glory of God. And you will see it 
God promised it, right? But are we doing it in the right way? Are we, first of all, you know, as men and women of God, is our life in order, right? Is our life in order? And we'll just look at this because like, even when we talk about elders and all that stuff, um, again, God puts these parameters on people's lives not to hinder them, but because he wants to connect the power of God to the people. You know, basically, we have to have wires in the wall. You know, it's good to plug things into the outlet, but without those wires that are put in in an orderly way and shielded and connected, right, coming from the power source, we're just not going to have any power. There's going to be no light, there's going to be no sound. It's just dark. And that's basically it, right? They wanted to see the glory of God, but unless you do it in the right way, you're just not going to see it. You're going to be in a place of darkness. So we'll just look at the elder uh, qualification here, just as an example, and then we'll just finish with the verse in, um, in Acts chapter 20. So here, uh, Paul instructing Timothy, right? And ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed, verse 6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. I like that. Even just that. Because you'll have people who will be in you know, elders in churches, and if you just look at their kids, their kids are like, woo, <laughs> nuts! <laughs> you know, climbing around. Like, they can't even control their kids, or if you go to their house, their kids, you know, punching holes in the wall. Just total chaos, and you go, this guy's in charge of something at church? <laughs> And, and sadly, people just go, well, it's sort of like any port in a storm. Well, anyone will do. But no, you know, we want things to be done in God's order. So it's like, that's why he says, look, how are their children? Because if they can't, if they can't even control their children, they really shouldn't be an elder in the church. Because how can they, you know, control the church? Because that's what you deal with, especially when you deal with a bunch of new believers. Right? For a bishop must be blameless. Bishop just means like an overseer, right? Uh, as the steward of God, not self-willed. That's, that's what I love. That's exactly what David was there initially. He was self-willed. The new cart. Right? That's not coming from God's written will. That's coming from David's will. The new cart for the ark. No. But we're not self-willed. I don't have to come up with a plan. I've got a plan. Written down. Written down. We know that it's good to preach the word. Why? Because Paul tells us. Preach the word. I'm not up here preaching the TV guide. That's not going to help. As much as we love it. Right? It's not going to help. Preach the word. Preach the word. So not self-willed. Characteristic of God's elders. Not soon angry. Right? You see someone with an anger problem. Oh, I find that very interesting. You know, people get angry or complain about people all the time. That's an anger problem, right? If you're constantly harping on someone, there's a bit of an anger issue. And you're disqualifying yourself from God using you. Like in the way where God's going to bless the people because you're out of order. You yourself are out of order. Right? Not given to wine, no striker, right? You're not, you're not a brawler, not for filthy lucre, you're not in it for money. But a lover of hospitality, that's what I like. There's always like... Because we're not just a church of, remember, I don't do that. I don't smoke, I don't drink. Well, what do you do? Nothing. <laughs> no, there is something we should do. A lover of hospitality, right? A lover of good men. That's what I like. Is, you know, we should love those that are fighting the fight of faith. Sober, just, holy, temperate. Holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught. So someone who's, who's been taught the word himself. He's got a lineage of teaching there. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So someone who's able to use that word to uh, exhort and to convince. Convince is a big word there. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And I think that that's how Paul contrasts. That he says, look, we need men like this. <laughs> right? Men who know how to handle their own kids. Men who, uh, the characteristics, they're not self-willed, they're not angry, but they love hospitality, they love blessing people, right? They love good men. That's, man, in the world right now, people hate good people, <laughs> right? The people that are being praised are just the weirdos, right? Just the weirdo, communist, perverted people. Those are the ones that are being praised and exalted and brought to the forefront. Good man, good people who hold to 
values, biblical values, are not being lifted up. They are being diminished. So we have to check our heart and make sure I, I love those that are really God's people. You know, sober, just, holy, temperate. All those words are not, uh, not taught to be temperate. What a thing. Holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught. But then contrasting it all with many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Just people just talking stuff. Deceiving people. Especially they have the circumcision. Obviously Paul they had a big issue back then with people trying to bring people back under the law. Right? That was the whole purpose of the council in Acts 15. Because they're saying, hey, if they can't be saved unless they're following Moses too. They've got to be circumcised too. So we had to have a big talk about it. And they said, no, they don't. They don't need to be for salvation. It has nothing to do with it. But then verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things what they ought not for filthy lucre. They're, right, they're teaching them for money. You have people teaching. And that's, a, that's one of the problems with the last days, is you're going to have people who just teach what people want to hear. Right? Survey Christianity. <laughs> That's like every new Saddleback church, every mega church, that's what you see. You know, we've been involved with a church playing group. We were going to plant a church up in Whitehorse. And even them, they're probably uh, Victory Church Canada. They're, they rely on this and trust the Holy Spirit. But even in themselves, they have this kind of survey thing that they want you to do in the community. And I, you know, there's no way. <laughs> because what that will do, that will skew you into providing a system for the people. Is God for the people? Absolutely. <laughs> but I believe when you do it according to the word of God, it will work. <laughs> it will work. And that's what David had to realize, right? He said, look, I know the new cart is easier for the Levites, right? It made much easier if we had all kinds of mechanisms in the churches, not just here, but all over, right? All kinds of systems to make life easier for the preachers and the music team and all that stuff. But is it easy we want? Right? <laughs> is that what we really want? Or do we want to do things the right way? There's a bit more pressure on our shoulders, yeah. But that's, what, that's the price we pay if we actually want God with us. And we know He's with us all the time, but actually Him to move in our midst, Him to bless the church, bless the services, move on the people. Let's do things the right way. Let's do things the right way. And let's just finish with this. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 20. This is probably one of my favorite portions in the whole Bible. It's where Paul's uh, on the beach here giving this speech to these elders. We're going to read from verse... Uh, let's see... I don't want to read the whole thing. So he's, he meets with um, the, the Ephesian elders, right? They meet him on this beach, which is such a cool picture in my head. Let's read from verse, uh, let's read from verse 18, and we'll just finish with his, his lesson here. So, and when they were come to him, he said to them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying way to the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. That's what I love. It's not like, oh, you know, I've got some secret knowledge that I'm not letting you in on. <laughs> no, Paul let him have everything he had. That's the right attitude. Because when you do that, you realize God will move. You want revelation from the Word of God, it'll just flow like a river when you don't hold back. Just bless the people. right? But I have showed you and have taught publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit of Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy, 
and the ministry that I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That last statement he makes there is, is so hard for people, especially now, as it gets harder and harder in the world. It is, we, the natural inclination is to, is to put the fence higher, move in, kind of take care of yourself. But that's not the answer. The answer is we have got to look less on ourselves and more on the things of God. Right? So Paul says there, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Wow, what a statement, right? Because when we're just looking to ourselves, because things are getting worse and worse, right? Evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. But Paul's like, I, you know, I, I, I stopped considering myself. I had to stop putting myself first. And when we do that, we can actually finish our course with joy. Because we know we're not, it's not about us. <laughs> it's not about us. Verse 25 says, And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And this is, this is the point here. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which your Bible school has made you an overseer. You know, in this age, you would think that would be it. It's not saying Bible school is bad, but if you're not released in that into your calling by the Holy Spirit, good luck. <laughs> It's just not going to be of God. And again, you're going to be trying to stabilize your life, help God with that ark on the cart. Right? It's the Holy Ghost that made them overseers. Right? The Holy, it's the work of God in someone's life. Right? Even that, we saw the qualifications for an elder. Now, you're not going to do that without God working in you. <laughs> right? It's not just some guy who doesn't have God in his life and is just a good guy. No, it has to be the work of God in his life. But it says, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. I love that. Are you looking? See, Paul had to say, look, I'm not looking after my own life. Are you? Right? Take heed unto yourselves. Most people like that part. But unto all the flock. How is everyone else doing? Right? How are they doing? Why? Because the Holy Ghost made them overseers. What? To take care of the sheep. <laughs> right? It's to see if there's wolves there, they can pull out that club and smack that wolf on the head. So get back from the sheep, you dirty dog. To which, uh, yeah, to, uh, I'll read that again. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Right? To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, and it's so true, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them, right? People come into the church, talk weird stuff, and draw people out of the church. That's so common. That's so, so common. You see, at every church, there'll be a church, God will be moving, there'll be some weirdo sharing his little opinions, or you know what's wrong with this guy, and then like a little group leaves. That's so common. Because the guy's never man enough to deal directly with the pastor publicly. They're cowards. And that's what they do, right? They don't, they, they, they're grievous wolves, and they speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They have these weird little disciple things. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. You see that, we see that Paul's, his just care for the church, and that's what I just get from this. I really just feel, man, you feel when you talk about this, the Holy Spirit uh, is grieved because he loves the church, right? God loves his church, loves it as his bride. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. That's what I love, right? 
The Word of God isn't just, uh, oh, it's just nice to hear. Isn't it nice hearing Scripture? Hallelujah. It's not just nice. It builds you up. And it doesn't just build you up. Look what it says. And to give you an inheritance. Oh, that's good. An inheritance among all them which are sanctified. We'll just stop there. That's just fantastic. So you're there hearing the word of God. And it's not, again, it's not just like, oh, okay, well, we got to do things God's way because so that people don't die like Uzzah. No, it's not just so that negative things don't happen while you obey. It's so that you yourself are built up so that when the storm comes, it doesn't affect you. And so that whoever is with you doesn't get affected. <laughs> right? Because there's people out there that need us to not be moved when the storm hits the community. And that's going to hit. Like it's hitting communities all over the world, different storms, you know. Every community goes through different trials. So when something comes to the community to hit it, are we stable? Are we stable enough? Are we doing what he said? But I love that. It's not able just to build you up, strengthen you, right? Build your house on a rock. It gives you that inheritance. Wow. Beyond, right? Gives you an inheritance in the things of God so that you have more than what you need. You have things you can give to others. It's so good. It's so important. So we saw like what Jesus said, those that worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and truth. It's wonderful to be dancing and singing before God, but how is everything else in our life? Are we doing things according to the Bible? Right? Are we doing it the right way? We're so blessed. We're not like the first century church. They didn't have this in a very nice bound book. <laughs> right? They're running around with some scrolls, and if you wanted the Old Testament scrolls, you're going still to the synagogues to hunt them up and copy them. And it's a huge deal. We're, we're way, way more blessed than them. I get this thing to carry around and read everything they wrote. They were just figuring it out. You know, and look what they did. Just They turned the world upside down for Jesus. And we should turn a few worlds upside down. We should at least turn the town upside down, right? The right way. The right way by just obeying what the Word of God says and being led by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, well, Father, thank you for your Word of Truth that there is a way. <laughs> like David said, that we sought Him not after the due order. There is a, an order in your Word a way that you want us to live our lives, how we should act, how we should be at home, and how we should be in the church, like Paul tells us, that we should be able to, how we should handle ourselves in the house of God. There's a way that you have for our life, Father. So help us to get on those rails, get the train of our life on that rail of truth, where we're obeying your word, where we're doing things according to your order, and on that rail of spirit, where we're obedient to the Holy Spirit, where we're working with Him, where He's the one convicting, He's the one putting uh, words in our mouths. As you said, you'll give us a mouth and wisdom in that hour. That we would not do it in our own strength and try and, oh, we got to, you know, help God out. Straighten that cart. The oxen are stumbling a little. But that, Father, we'd be like the Levites. We'd do things according to your word. We wouldn't mind the pressure. And that is a pressure. It's not an overburden. But there is a pressure that's on our shoulders, Lord, as we carry you and your way with us. We are different than the world. We're supposed to walk differently. We're not supposed to have those new carts. We're supposed to be bearing your glory on our shoulders. Let's not be afraid of that, Lord afraid of walking the right way because we know that your word says in due time we shall reap if we faint not we shall reap what we've sowed Lord so help us to just walk according to your word that we would be that New Testament church where we're meeting our standards as you show we're supposed to live as as men and women how we're supposed to have our houses in order and that we'd also then trust that your Holy Spirit in the, the moments would be able to turn us 
and turn our ear and give us words of peace and hope and joy for those that are lost and confused right now. And there's so many, but we know your plan ultimately is victory and you want to bring your glory to this place and into our homes and into our hearts. So we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your word. Sometimes it's a correction. <laughs> we just need to correct our course a little, but it's because you're bringing us to a perfect destination. And you don't want us to miss anything. You want us to get a full inheritance that you have for us. So we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.